today we'll be deepening our cultural knowledge of Singapore and this unique Singaporean way of multiculturalism. Amira will ask if you have, our, our guest speaker Amira will ask um, if you have questions at specific times during the event, so please make sure that you keep your questions in mind for those times. A few details to go over before we get started. Um, if you can make sure that your cell phones are off, that would be great. And in case there's an emergency, there are four exits in the corners. Um, we take your feedback seriously, so if you can make sure to fill out your surveys before you go, we'll collect those at the end. And if you have any additional questions about Singapore, feel free to jot those down on your surveys. Um, and if your professor offered you extra credit for this event, please make sure that you sign out at the sign out table before you leave so that they see that you are here for the whole event. Um, we'll also be serving a Singaporean traditional snack in the lobby after the event uh, called Suji Cookies. Um, so make sure that you stick around for that. Um, and lastly, if you're interested in learning more about the work that we do, please feel free to come stop by our office in Snohomish 301. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome our guest speaker, Amira Sauer. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. First, I would like to introduce myself. Oh, sorry. I would like to show you a video of Singapore's multiculturalism. saw right there is a National Day song in Singapore. In Singapore, it is very common to have National Day songs every single year. And that year is about multiculturalism as well, as, as you can see. 
first I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Amira. This right here is my family. This is my mom, my dad, my sister Atika, my other sister Adila, and they're dating a Chinese guy and an Indian guy. He is going to be my brother-in-law soon. We are all Singaporean, by the way. Um, I like to draw during my free time. I'm a digital artist, and then this is one of the paintings I've done. I am currently living with my husband, Ben, in the US. I'm also born and raised Singaporean, by the way. <laughs> um, during my free time as well, I do like to go to game. And this is the current game I'm playing, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, if you guys like to play games. I'm also a full-time student in Edmonds Community College. And I also like to make YouTube videos. This is Everyday Norms, and I like to play horror games. And this is Spooky Tavern, my YouTube horror channel. A little bit more about my background. I had a diploma in digital media design in Nanyang Polytechnic in Singapore. I worked for visual effects for film and TV shows from 2010 to 2018. I worked as a roto paint artist. And these are some of the shows that I worked for, TV, TV shows as well, and film that I worked for during that time. If you want to know more about that, you can go to my website, amirasawa.com. So first, I want to know, what do you guys know about Singapore? A show of hands. Has anyone seen the Crazy Rich Asians movie? OK. What about, you heard that Singapore is very clean? OK. <laughs> What about the chewing gum ban? I guess that's famous, huh? And if you heard that Singapore is a city in China, has anyone? Maybe? OK. So that's a picture of fines in Singapore. It is, it is an offense to eat and drink in the train stations in Singapore. And of course, you can't have any durians. That's a smelly fruit that we like. Um, it is such a thing that er because everything has fines in Singapore, people make coasters out of it. So you can see Singapore coast is Singapore is a fine city. Anything you do, there's a fine for it. So where is Singapore? Singapore is also known as the little red dot. It is because when you look at the globe, it is the, the land mass is so small that all you see is one dot saying Singapore. So Singapore is located in Southeast Asia. It is bordered by North Malaysia and South Indonesia. Except for the occasional floods, Singapore does not experience any natural disasters. So it's a very safe country. So more quick facts about Singapore. Singapore is a city-state, which means that it is a city and a country by itself. For example, if let's say Edmonds is a whole country by itself, that's what Singapore is, the city-state. It is 100% urban, so there is no countryside in Singapore. Singapore has been independent for 54 years. And it is only 280 square miles. That means that the whole country is just about two times the size of Seattle. So it is a very small country, very small and dense country. So the weather in Singapore, it is hot and humid all year round. Average temperature is about 25 to 31 degrees Celsius, which is about 77 to 88 degrees Celsius. Most Singaporeans like to stay indoors in air-conditioned areas because it's just so humid outside. So a little bit more about our flag. Our flag looks like this. It has a crescent moon, five stars, and it's red and white. Red represents universal brotherhood and equality of man. The white, pervading and everlasting priority and virtue. The crescent moon represents a young nation on the ascent, and our five stars represent democracy, peace, progress, justice, and equality. So a little bit more about the history of Singapore. Singapore is supposedly founded by Sang Nila Utama. He was a Sri Vijayan prince. He was born on the, 30, on the 13th century. So it was heard that Sang Nila Utama saw a strange beast that's supposed to be a lion. So his reign was in 12, 1299 to 1347. That being said, however, the actual origin of the name Singapore is unclear according to scholars. So what does Singapore mean? Singapore comes from the word Singapura. And Singa means lion, Pura means city. That being said, however, we know that there is no such thing as lions in Singapore. So what Sang Nila Utama probably would have seen was a Malayan tiger, not a lion. 
This creature right here is called a merlion. It has a head of a lion and a body of a fish. You can see this creature in the coastal waters in Singapore. I am kidding. There is no such thing as the merlion, but it is our national mascot. So a little bit more about the history of Singapore. Sir Stamford Raffles was a British statesman, part of the British East India Company. So he recognized Singapore as a choice, as a great choice for a new port because Singapore has natural harbors. So when he arrived in 1819, Singapore only had a thousand people. But by, the, by 1871, Singapore's population reached to 100,000 people. It was, Singapore was also a great port because it was not controlled by the Dutch, so it was a free land for him. So Singapore gained independence from the British Empire in 1963 by joining Malaysia, but separated from Malaysia after two years. So Singapore became a fully sovereign state by 1965. So Singapore is a very young country. Singapore is younger than my mom. <laughs> so you couldn't talk about Singapore without talking about Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. In 1965, Singapore, there was only 1.8 million people, and the GDP per capita in, in Singapore was only about 500 USD. While at that time, the USD for the the, U, the USAD GDP was about 4,000. But by 2019, Singapore, Singapore has caught up and Singapore has 5.7 million people. The GDP per capita was about, it's about 64,000 USD and the USD, uh, the, the GDP for USA is USD $65,000. So this is an image on the left side of Singapore in, in 1960 and this is an image of Singapore right now. So you can see that there is a huge difference. So a little bit more about the population demographic in Singapore. There's 5.7 million people in Singapore in 2019. 4.03 million are citizens or permanent residents. 1.68 million are non-residents. So one in five, I think, for non-residents. For the, for the citizens, 76.2% 76, are Chinese people. 15% Malay, 7.4 Indian people, and 0.4% Eurasian. That's the 2015 stats. I don't have the new stats for that. There are also non-residents for 2006 stats. So there's Australians, Malaysians, um, people from the UK and the, and the US, China, Indonesia, Canada, etc. So for the most part, a lot of, of non-residents in Singapore come from areas around Singapore in Southeast Asia. And of course, Australia is not too far away as well. Non-residents in Singapore, what they tend to do is usually either work or go to school. So Singapore has a good education system, so there are a lot of students who go to school in Singapore from overseas. So there's such thing as um, work permit holders, for example, if you want to work in construction in Singapore, there's also foreign domestic workers, employment pass holders for professionals and executives, and the SPAS for healthcare and social services. So the Singapore economy, since Singapore does not have any natural resources, the resources for Singapore is basically people. So we are the resources. Singapore is a highly open economy, however. It, is, it has a manufacturing industry. It has electronic, biomedical, sciences, and logistics, of course, because Singapore is a huge harbor. Um, we also have the finances, financial services industry, which is huge in Singapore. And if you can see the, the skyline in Singapore, for the most part, all the tall buildings are owned by banks. So we have time for a couple of questions so far. Do anyone have any questions? Yes. You kind of showed the changes that happened in, I don't know, a couple of years between the past and Singapore now but you didn't say how it happened or what caused for that dramatic change. Uh, what, what caused? What caused oh. the changes that happened and how it became so right. advanced in just a couple of years. Right. Um, as I mentioned previously, I can show you. Because Singapore became a, a harbor for, for many countries, so it's an open economy. It lets businesses in. And, it was, and I think I mentioned the, the Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. 
he basically brought Singapore together and he, and he made Singapore from third world country to first world country. So it's basically a lot of hard work from people and being a very open economy for businesses. So, so that's how Singapore went from, from, from 1965 to 2019 Singapore, very different. Any other questions so far? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving on. So for those who have seen Crazy Rich Asians in Singapore and, and those who have not, basically Crazy Rich Asians was a 20, 2018 Hollywood romantic comedy. It is based on a book and it featured Singaporean actors and actresses and parts of Singapore. Um, I have seen Crazy Rich Asians and personally I do enjoy it. However, that is a point of view of a minority of Singaporeans. So that's like the 1% of the 1%. So just to be fair, most Singaporeans are not that rich. <laughs> so so it's, it's, not, it's not like that in Singapore. Um, there's also this thing whereby, you know, for the most part you can see Chinese people in Singapore, but they did not show the diversity of Singapore. There are a lot more Malay and Indian people as well, and Eurasian people too. But, but I do enjoy the show, it's quite fun. So, Singapore laws compared to the US. Let me read this here. Freedom of the press, freedom of the news media must be subordinated to the overriding needs of the integrity of Singapore and to the primacy of the purpose of an elected government. But Obama said, we have to uphold a free press and free speech because in the end, lies and misinformation are no match for the truth. So you can see that there is quite a difference in terms of governing the country for Singapore and the US. Um, it is, it is uh, interesting, however, because Mr. Lee Kuan Yew only wanted peace in Singapore. So this, in his point of view, that this is how you have peace in the country. So another example of Singapore laws for the media if you do not know, it's illegal to have pornography in Singapore. So, an illegal act and punishment right here. So, if you make or reproduce obscene film, you can be fined up to $40,000 or imprisonment up to two years. So, from what I heard, I think you can still watch pornography, but you cannot keep pornography. Uh, this ratings right here is actually a rating for movies in Singapore. So, you have G, PG, PG-13, NC-16, M-18, and R-21. The numbers represent the age, of, the age that you can watch the show. So for example, when I was 16, I wanted to watch a zombie horror show, and I was three months away from being 16 years old, and I could not watch that show, unfortunately. So this is another example. I like Black Swan. I don't know if you have seen it before. And in Singapore, it was rated R-21. And I did watch it in the movie theater, but there were, there, was, there were parts of the show that was completely cut off. So even though the, it was rated R21, there is still some censorship for the movie, in the movie theaters as well. I, have not, I still have not seen the full show yet, so it'll be nice to go back and go see the full show again. So Singapore has very strict drug laws. So Singapore has a hard line when it comes to drugs for example here, you know that in Washington state, weed is legal, but in Singapore, if you have any kind of cannabis, and if you have more than 500 grams of it with you, it is a mandatory death penalty. So if you ever go to Singapore, please do not bring drugs. It, they already say here, death for drug, drug traffickers under the Singapore law. So yeah, don't bring drugs. And in Singapore as well, when you say drugs, they mean these drugs. They don't mean medicine drugs. When, when it's medicine drugs, they just say it's medicine. So, the Singapore government. Singapore has, a, I would say, a dominant party system. There is this party called the People's Action Party, and it has been in power since independence, since 1965. There are also other parties, however, such as the Reform Party, the Singapore People's Party, the Singapore Democratic Party, the Singapore Democratic Alliance, and the Workers' Party. So these are the presidents of Singapore. As you can see, our presidents are also multicultural, multiracial. Um, our, our current president is Madam Halima Yaakob. She's been in power since 2017. What I've heard 
so far from Singapore is that because we have, we have our Malay presidents here and we have our Chinese presidents as well and our Indian, our Indian presidents. So I heard that um, because we don't have enough Eurasian presidents, there might be a reserve election for the next president because our only Eurasian president was Mr. Benjamin Shears. So, president's salary comparison. Currently, President Trump is making $400,000 a year, and he's only accepting $1 annually while donating the rest. Our president, Halima Yaakob, she's making $1.4 million a year. That said, the Singapore president is not the only president that, she, she, does, she's, she holds more of a ceremonial role, and we have something called the Prime Minister, which is similar to the UK government. And this is Mr. Lee Sien Long. He is the son of Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and he makes $1.6 million a year. So, Singapore has 16 ministries. We have a ministry called the Ministry of Environment, the Ministry of National Development, Ministry of Manpower. We have the Ministry of Transport and Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well, of course. And if you're in school most of the time, you will see this logo everywhere. That's the Ministry of Education. So you can see Singapore's budget right here. Uh, we have high budgets for home affairs, transport, health, education, and up top is defense. So this is in billions of dollars, as you can see. Um, Speaking of defense, all male Singaporean citizens, second generation permanent residents, have to serve this thing called NS. It's called National Service, and it's two years of active duty in the military. So most people, most of the guys, they will, they will serve it right after secondary school or high school, you would say, or after their, their studies after university. So the CPF, there's this thing called the Central Provident Fund in Singapore and it is basically a compulsory savings plan for Singaporean and permanent residents. It, it helps your, to fund your retirement, your healthcare and housing. So you can use this fund to buy a home in Singapore or you can use this fund even for your education as well. So you can think about it as as a 401k, but a compulsory 401k. So, housing in Singapore. There's this thing called the HDB, which is the Housing Development Board. It is public housing about, for about 78% of the resident population in Singapore. So, yeah, most of Singaporeans, they live in public housing. So, in Singapore, if you live in a single family home or you live in a condominium, that would mean that you are living in private housing. So this image right here is actually the block that my parents are living in right now. <laughs> so it looks something like this. There are a lot of malls in Singapore. <laughs> so 103 malls to be exact. Um, I guess Singapore like to shop. <laughs> so. These are some of the examples of how the malls look like. Um, this example here, this is Orchard Ion, and that's in Orchard Road. That's the most famous place where people go to shop. That's what we call in town in Singapore. And this is the Marina Bay Sands. If you know the building that has that banana-shaped thing on the top, the three buildings, yeah, this is what it looks like inside. And when I was younger, because I live in Tampines, I used to go to Tampines Mall, which is close to where I live at home. So, the cost of living in Singapore. From EIU.com, 2019 rankings show that Singapore is number one most expensive city in the world. And that is above Paris, Hong Kong, and two cities in Switzerland. You have to remember, however, Singapore is, the, is, is a city state. So, it is 100% urban, and if it's too expensive, the only way you can live in Singapore or not live in Singapore is to leave the country because it is really expensive. The whole country is expensive. You cannot go anywhere else. So, for example, this is a 2020 RAV4. I have a 2010 RAV4. 
Does anyone have any idea how much it costs in US dollars? Anyone? No? Okay. So it costs about $25,000 in the US. Does anyone want to get, make a guess on how much it costs in Singapore? 80? Close? 80 is good. It costs $95,000 USD in Singapore. Okay, that is not all, however. So you have this thing called the COE. That is the Certificate of Entitlement. Basically, it is like a license that is given to people who, who have just, just, so, just so that you can own cars in Singapore. So it is like a license, here, we give you the right to own this car in Singapore. And that license, it, it's only, it, it's only, it gives you the legal right for the holder to hold the vehicle for only 10 years. So after 10 years, you have to buy, it, buy that COE again. So for example, a COE might cost about 27,000 USD. So that would mean the, your total cost of a RAV4 is about $122,000. So can you imagine in USD, this, this could basically buy you a home here maybe, or, or maybe a very fancy car, not just a Toyota RAV4, right? So there's this thing called the Singaporean dream. <laughs> early in, in the early 90s, and 2000s, everyone's talking about the Singaporean dream. It is the five C's of Singapore. You want to own your car, you want to have a private condo, you want to have cash, you want to have a country club membership, which means that you make a lot of money, and you want to have your credit card. I would like to show you a video on what Singaporeans think about the five C's right now. Smartlocal.com Hi everyone, I'm Fauzi and welcome to a brand new episode of Word in the Street. Back in the day, there was a long running joke that Singaporeans use the five C's as a measure of success. But times have since changed and so have many Singaporeans. So I'm taking the streets to find out if people still care about the five C's. What do you guys do for a living? I'm a student. Oh. Same. <laughs> <laughs> Going to become an architect. Currently studying Japan. What are some of your dreams and ambitions? Hopefully one day I can become a filmmaker. I would like to become a festival and events manager in the future. Oh wow. Yeah. I seek to aim my first million in the next three years. Same, like we have the same ambition and go up. You want to be a millionaire in three years? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> when would you be able to consider yourself successful? Being happy and content with everything I have. Huh? When I make enough money to support my parents. Yeah. As long as I have a decent amount in my bank, let's say let's talk about 5k and above uh, in the bank. And of course living in a house with my wife, you know, got <laughs> two kids around there. To you, what is the Singaporean dream? It's going to university and then probably making six digits. <laughs> and hopefully get a good job and just settle for life. The Singaporean dream is, of course, to have a condominium one day. Have a nice car, BMW or Mercedes. Okay. Uh. Have enough money to, like, you can come here and shop, like, nobody business. I'm asking people about these questions because I want to find out if Singaporeans still care about the five C's. Have you heard of this term, the five C's, and do you know what they are? Cash. Mm -hmm. Cars. Credit cards. Okay. Condominium. Club membership. Back in the days, right? Singaporeans use these as a measure of their success. Why do you think Singaporeans play such value in these things last time? They have expectation of like a high standard of living. Okay. I believe it's because it gives them an advantage to further progress in life or okay. to live life more comfortably. Maybe it makes people like look up to them, like the status up there. It represents that you make a lot of money okay. and that you can afford luxurious items. Although I don't want to say that everyone's materialistic, okay. but the ideal of 5Cs does give the impression that you might be materialistic in terms of defining your own success. Do you think these things are as important today to Singaporeans or have they changed? I think a lot of Singaporeans now prioritise experience. So like travelling is one more Cars maybe not as important now sure. with Grab and Uber around. Yeah. Yes. Like all my friends around me are like, oh, I want to have a condo. I want to get like a Mercedes when I'm older. And it's like pocket change to me if I buy something from like Chanel. <laughs>
because people still care about having a car and a credit card and money in general. Mm. If you really think these are all important to you, then go ahead. But if not, a HDB is enough. EasyLink card is enough instead of a car. Singapore is providing many MRT lines for us. It's an alternative to cars. I think it's honestly it's not so important now as in this to Singaporeans. I think it's all about stable, stabilizing your life down here. Wow, the government will love you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got a board here and we've got the original 5Cs plus a lot of other f C words. Right? What I want you to do is work together as a pair and come up with your new 5Cs. All right? <laughs> So you guys seem to have changed all uh, four out of five of them yep. and chose to keep cash. So most of the other things you have are the intangible things. Now explain your choices. Cash uh, is very important so that you can mm -hmm. uh, you know, support ourselves, you know, you can buy all the things you want. Mm -hmm. Commitment, of course, when you have a goal, you got to commit to your goals. If not, it won't happen. All right. I think as a person, it's very important to have a character. You might have other five Cs, but what if you don't have like the basic character or decency or conscience as being a person? We live such an affluent lifestyle nowadays, so our basic needs are already taken care of. Having a cause kind of gives our life purpose also. In Singapore, your career is like the most important because it earns you money. To have a career, I would imagine you need ambition. And if you have ambition, then you can always, you'll always be successful. Because you'll always find a way to be successful. With the exercise in mind, all right, do you think the priorities of Singaporeans today have changed? And why do you think so? People nowadays don't think that money is everything. Yeah, so they like realize that um, family, friends, like relationships are what more, what is more important. I think priorities have changed a little. For example, like having children. I think I feel like our generation kind of put that on the back seat. Like we, we kind of want to be successful first. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's changed because we know what to prioritize now. Because back then, it was just about survival, but now it's more of self fulfillment. Yeah. That's actually a very good point. It's so clever. Do you think this change in priorities is beneficial to Singapore? Yes, in a way that, I mean, it's good that we change our priorities. We are kind of like developing ourselves less materialistically. If we focus so much on materialistic things, we don't have uh, a chance to develop on our own sp spirituality and uh, our own selves, you know? Any last words for people out there watching this video? You should do what you love. Set some goals, set dreams, and execute on them while we are young. Because uh, Bill Gates, quoted by Bill Gates, I, I've never rested a day in my 20s. The most important thing about success is that you're happy with yourself. So. Bam! Damn, sister! You get it, girl? So most of the people we talk to don't hold the five C's as a measure of their success. While certain things like cash are still as important to the majority, a lot of Singaporeans place a larger emphasis on becoming better people. That's it for this episode of One in the Street. To watch all of the videos, you can click over here. And as always, like, share and subscribe. And until next time, bye! So you can see that most Singaporeans don't think about the five C's as much anymore. So any more questions? I have time for a couple of questions so far. Yes. Um, judging from the picture of your family that you posted, I saw that your mom is wearing a hijab, mm -hmm. and uh, the, also the new president is wearing a hijab. But I haven't. Sorry, the, the, the also the, the president the is wearing president, the hijab. Yes, right. But I haven't seen the percentage of religions in Singapore and how diverse actually it is. Yeah, I'm, I will explain uh, that next. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is the primary language uh, English? It is. I will explain that next too. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, so, um, if Singapore is so expensive, mm -hmm. uh, how's the government helping the people who do not have access to a high to a high paying job? Do not have access to a high paying job. I yeah. think. The, I think you know inequality. How's the uh, government trying to help the people who don't have access to a high-paying job? Right. For the first part, I would say that um, because Singapore is, they they put a lot of emphasis on education, and with a good education, for the most part, you should get an a, a high-paying job in the future. So yeah, a lot of Singaporeans, something like like I have like a diploma that is basically a three-year associate's degree. 
And with that, that's enough skills for you to get a decent paying job from, from the start. There's also this thing whereby because a lot of Singaporeans, they live with their parents and it is normal to live with your parents in Singapore. So you can definitely help with like three or four people that are working in one home in Singapore. So that's how they do it. Yeah. Sorry. in ISS for 20 years. <laughs> so when you talk about how do the government support, help the people in Singapore. In Singapore, we have subsidized housing. That is very important. That means to say, when you buy a house, the government helps you. So the, when she was talking about the public CPF, housing, yeah. public housing yep. CPF, Central Provident Fund. Mm -hmm. So every month when you earn, when you make your salary, the government pays 17% and then you deduct 20% on your pay to go into this central fund and it earns interest. Yeah. With that money, as you accumulate, you can go and buy an, an apartment, yep. two room, three room, four room, five room, six room apartment. And every month, you pay the mortgage through the CPF. That means you don't pay out of pocket. Yep. So that in Singapore, why you say Singapore is so expensive? It's the housing because we are so small. So housing and land is very, very expensive. And one way the government help you is that they help you to buy your own property. So in Singapore, majority of Singapore own their own houses. Mm -hmm. They don't rent. So everybody has their own house. Yep. It's either if you have a, not much, if you don't have a lot of money in the Central Provident Fund, you buy a smaller one, maybe a two bedroom, and then you increase to a three bedroom and a four bedroom, and you can have a six bedroom if you want. So government helps in that a lot with the housing because I think in America too, housing is, is an issue. very expensive yep. and that is the basic that you have a roof over your head. So mm -hmm. the government helps in that way. So I bought my first condominium with CPF. I couldn't yeah. afford it. I had to pay the down payment, right. the mortgage. Everything was paid by the government. I never had to touch my salary. So does that answer your question? <laughs> Uh, on the topic of education, how mm. uh, I'm sorry if you answered this question or not, but yeah. is, it f uh, is education available for free for everybody? And what about high, higher level education like um, um, universities? Right. Um, education is heavily subsidized in Singapore. So let's say, for example, if you are in primary school and it, it might be maybe $20 a semester, it's really, really cheap. So it's like, if you, even if you can't afford that, the government will help you if you are in a, in a lower bracket and, you, and your family couldn't afford it. So yeah, it's very he heavily subsidized in Singapore. Sorry? You, you, you can have loans, but again, you can use your CPF to pay for your, for your education in Singapore as well. So if, if let's say you work for a few years and you have CPF savings, or maybe your parents can pay for, for your education through CPF. So that's how we do it in Singapore. Any more questions? Yes. Um, how do Singaporeans view mental illness? Someone has depression or anxiety? Or right. Um, we have this thing called the Institute of Mental Health, and that they help Singapore, Singaporeans with mental illnesses. Um, that it, is a lot, it used to be a more closed society, so it was a little bit difficult back then but I see that it is more open now. So you can always have help from the, the government right now, yeah. So can I move on? <laughs> okay, so this is about the languages of Singapore like I mentioned previously. Um, we have four official languages. That is Malay, English, Mandarin, and Tamil. So Malay is the national language in Singapore but English is used as the main working language, so it's, it is more widely used. And Singa most Singaporeans are, bi are bilingual, so that means they can speak English and another language. So for example, I can speak English and Malay. So this is an example of like a construction area in Singapore. It is very common because Singapore is always a work in progress. This is a common thing you can see. You can see that it says danger, keep out, and the three other languages on it. There is also this thing called Singlish in Singapore, Singaporean English. You can hear from that video that Singapore has a, Singaporeans have a very interesting accent. 
and maybe you might not be able to catch the, that accent, but that is Singlish. And you know, when we speak in Singlish, we have like a sentence, and it has many different words for many different, many different um, languages right here. So, for example, let me try and say this. It says, "They woman pakto always makan at kopitiam one." So that has Tamil, Mandarin, Cantonese, Malay, English, and Hokkien in one sentence. So for the translation, it basically means, hey, when we go on a date, we always eat at a coffee shop. A coffee shop is similar to like a food court here, whereby you can go to a place and there are many different food stalls that you can buy from in Singapore. That's very common there. So Singapore, the Singlish language also has this thing called particles. So we can use the particles to change the meaning or tone of a sentence. So you can try and understand some of the, some of the sentences on the right. So for example, if I say, can la, it means yes. But if I say, can I, it means I'm questioning you. Are you sure? It's not a yes. So of course you can say like, can can, which means yes, yeah, sure, confirm, you know. So more nuances of Singlish. Let me just say it here. For example, if you say, I don't have la, it means I really don't have it. Or if you say, I don't have law, it means I wish I had it, but sadly, I don't. Or you can say, I don't have liao, which means I used to have it, but I don't anymore. So you can see that every single particle can mean something to the sentence. Getting around in Singapore is very easy. You can use a grab which is basically Uber in Singapore. They, they have Uber as well there, so Uber and Grab. Uh, we have taxis, we have public buses that always run on time, and we have um, train stations in Singapore. So we have this thing called the MRT, which is a mass rapid transit in Singapore. So this is a MRT route map. I used to live right here in Tampines, and I used to work over here in Buena Vista. So I can work in the east and work in the west in Singapore because it's that small. But this is an old map of, old MRT map in Singapore. This is the current system map in Singapore. So as you can see, it is very convenient. You can go almost anywhere in Singapore and you'll be fine. So the train map, the, the train is, runs on time and it's great. And because, like I said, Singapore is always a work in progress, this is the system map that's going to be in the future. So I heard that Singapore is already building this brown line right here and it's going to open in stages. So it will open in 2022, 2023, 2024 until it's completely finished. So as my question, your question just now about the religion in Singapore. So this is, these are the religions in Singapore. Um, Singapore has 34% Buddhist, 14% Muslim, 11% Taoist, and the rest are Catholic, Hindu, Christian, others, and of course, there's people with no religion as well. So the buildings, the religious buildings in Singapore are really beautiful. So if you go to Singapore, please, please do visit them. For example, over here, we have the Chinese Buddhist temples uh, or Taoist temples, and we have the, the mosque in Singapore. We have the Hindu temples here, and this is a synagogue. And because Singapore is so multi-religious as well, there is this thing called the Loyang Tua Pei Kong. It is a multi-religious temple. So it caters to three different religions, the Taoists, the Hindus, and the Buddhists. So it would be nice if you can go visit there if you go to visit Singapore. It's really interesting. About the Muslims in Singapore. So the Muslims in Singapore are mostly Malay. And there's this thing called the Majlis Ugama Islam Singapura, that is MUIS, which is basically the Islamic Council of Singapore. It is established by the government in 1968 to handle all Islamic affairs. If you don't already know, if you are Muslim, you have to eat halal food. And that's similar to like kosher food for the Jews. So in Singapore, you need to get this, if you are, if you are a restaurant and you want to serve halal food, you need to get this thing called a halal certificate. And it is a very rigorous process to get the halal certificate. And because it's such a rigorous process, when they get the halal certificate, people celebrate. That the, the, the shops just celebrate it. So for example, you have your Krispy Kreme here saying that 
We're happy to announce that Krispy Kreme Singapore is certified halal. There are also many different types of, of food in Singapore. Like I said, there's, there's, like, there's Korean food here, and then there's Japanese ramen here. So yeah, if you, if you want to get certified halal, it is a rigorous process, but you'll cater to 15% more of the population. So more about Singaporean cuisine. I'm sorry. <laughs> So in, in, for Singaporean cuisine, in Singapore, food is viewed as a national identity and a unifying cultural thread. So because we have different races, we have different cultures, our food is a different type, like it, it has a very, diff, very much variety of the mix of races and food. So this is an example of a Chinese food called Hainanese chicken rice. I don't know if you have had it before. It is really, really good. <laughs> Okay, these are some of my favorite food. I'm sorry if you like Singapore food, you, you might miss that too. So, bihun goreng is right here. It is basically fried noodles and it is influenced, I would say, English, English Chinese and Malay, uh, Indian Chinese and Malay because it is, usually, it is usually cooked by Indian people and, you know, bihun is actually Chinese but the word goreng means is Malay. So we have no idea where exactly this came from. So I think it's a mixture of all the cultures. There is this thing called popia. I miss popia so much. It is similar to <laughs> it is similar to your Vietnamese spring rolls, but the flavor is very different. Yeah. And then I also miss my satay, which is Malay influence, and it is basically skewered meats, but with different type of spices. There is also this thing called carrot cake in Singapore. And when you say carrot cake in Singapore, it's not the kind of carrot cake here. So it is basically radish with flour and it is fried with soy sauce, sweet soy sauce and egg. It is really, really good as well. And then there's, we have this thing called otak otak, which is in Malay it means brains, but it is actually, um, it is fish paste. So it's made from fish meat with a lot of spices and then it's grilled in, I think it's called banana leaf. And then we have the murtabak, that's my, current, my, my husband's current favorite food. It is, it is Indian influence and it's like a crepe, like roti prata, but it has, I don't know if you guys know what roti prata is, paratha, and it has, it has um, meat inside as well, minced meat. <laughs> well, it's not my favorite. <laughs> yeah, but I do like popia, close, the flavor is close. So any questions so far? Anyone? Two, three, four, okay. I'm going to move on then. So about the students in Singapore. So Singapore's um, education system is kind of similar to the UK education system. We have this thing called the GCE or GCSE O levels, A levels and N levels. So for, for Singaporeans, age 16 years old, they will have to take the GCE O levels and that will determine where they're going to go after. So for example, they can go to integrated programs, junior college, polytechnic. So I went to a polytechnic and then they can also go to an Institute of Technical Education, which is an ITE. So this is really important. This one test will basically dictate where you're going to go next. If you, if you don't do too well, you usually go to an ITE. If you do okay, you usually go to a polytechnic and sometimes, for the most part, you get, your results can go to a junior college as well. And after that, you can go to a tertiary education, which is getting your bachelor's or your master's degree. So the thing here, however, even though you don't do too well and you go to an ITE, you can still move ahead to go to a polytechnic and then go to a tertiary education for your, master, uh, for your bachelor's or master's. So there is no, there's always a way forward for you when it comes to education. So in Singapore, students wear uniforms. This is an example of a primary school uniform. Uh, different schools have different uniforms. This is an example of a secondary school uniform. So this is before O levels. This is actually the same uniform that I used when I was in secondary school because I went to Dunman Secondary School. Uh, this is an example of a junior college uniform. And I went to Nanyang Polytechnic as well. So this is how my school looked like in Singapore. And in, in polytechnic, you can wear your own clothes, but there are also, also strict rules such as no brightly colored hair, 
uh, no flip-flops, stuff like that. So there's still some rules, but for the most part, you can wear your own clothes. So it is a uniquely Singaporean experience for students. I would like to share a story. You know, when I was, when I was uh, in school for my GCE O levels, I studied really, really hard, and I studied at night as well. So I go to the airport to study. I know it's, not, it's a very weird concept for most people, but our airport is really, really nice. So for a lot of students in the east, and I live, I live in the east side, they, they tend to go to the, the airport to study. So I went to the McDonald's there or the coffee bean there to study. Um, I heard that the Singapore airport has improved since I left. There is this thing called the Jewel. I think it is basically like a much bigger version of the Spears in Seattle. <laughs> so there are really cool uh, plants in there and it's covered up and there's a huge waterfall there. I have not seen it in real life yet, so I'm hoping I could see it soon. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> it's a city in a city. Great, yeah. So, racial harmony in Singapore. In 1964, that is before Singapore separated from Malaysia, there were the July race riots. So, basically there were, there were riots between the Malay community and the Chinese community in Singapore. So, because of that, Singapore, the Singapore government decided to create Racial Harmony Day that's observed on July 21st of every year. This is not a national hol holiday, however, but it is celebrated by all students in school when they are in school. So Singapore has zero, zero tolerance for racism. And yeah, <laughs> it's great, right? So, so the thing is that um, in, I, it's weird because in, in the US, they might call it cultural appropriation. But in Singapore, we call it cultural appreciation. As you can see over here, you have Chinese girls wearing Indian costumes, Indian ethnic costumes, and you have Chinese boys wearing Malay ethnic costumes, and that is actually promoted in Singapore because in their opinion, if you don't wear it, you wouldn't know how it's like to, to, to be another person's race. So we, we really encourage this in Singapore. It is normal. So a little bit more about my, my background here. So if you go to Singapore, please visit the Singapore Zoological Gardens and the Jurong Bird Park. They are beautiful, it's great. I get to hold a snake, it was fun, that's me. This is my two sisters and my mom and dad. And that's me, this is my two sisters and my mom and dad. So during Eid, a, re a, religious, harmony, a religious holiday in, for the Muslims in Singapore, we wear our ethnic costumes as well. This is called a kabaya and a baju kurung in Singapore. So this is during Eid. And because, again, we, we think it's cultural appreciation, we wear our Indian costumes for my cousin's wedding. So this is called, I guess we call it the Punjabi dress. So I want to share a little bit of my results on 23andMe. I mean, you heard about being a nation of immigrants. You would say that Singapore is really a nation of immigrants because at 1819 there were only 1,000 people, but now there's 5.7 million people. So that's, that's a huge growth. So my results on 23andMe, if you don't know what 23andMe is, it is basically a DNA test. And I have results from Central and South Asian, European, East Asian, and Native American um, uh, backgrounds. So basically, my ancestors came from all over the world. It is very interesting, but honestly not surprising knowing that Singapore is such a multicultural country. So as you can see here, speaking of multiculturalism, my husband here is American, but we are all here Singaporean, and we will say that my, my dad's Javanese, my mom is considered Malay, and then my sister's dating a Chinese boy, and my soon-to-be brother-in-law is Indian. So we are a fully multicultural, multiracial family. So, navigating views and culture living overseas. Does anyone know what is this here? It is not a trick question. <laughs> so, when I was living, when, when I moved from Singapore to New Zealand, that was my first time living overseas, I have no idea how to use a washer. It is the truth. It was embarrassing because I was 24 years old. The thing is that because Singaporeans, kids, they tend to take studying 
so seriously. It's almost like a job. And my mother never, never taught me how to use a washer because she washed all our clothes. And it was embarrassing because I had to ask my roommate, hey, can you teach me how to use this? And she was like, oh my goodness, Amira, how can you not know how to use this? You know? So it's, it, is, it is something I learned uh, as I, when I left Singapore. So it is, it's just basically learning how to be independent, right? So I lived in, in New Zealand for a year and a half. I lived in Canada, I think, for about three years. And now I'm currently living in the US. There is this thing in, for the first time when I went to New Zealand, I had people saying, hey, good morning, well, while I was walking down the street. And I was like, the first reaction was, you know, it's like, hey, you're talking to me? And, and he was like, yeah, you, good morning. And I'm like, oh, good morning. Because in Singapore, it is weird to talk to strangers. So when, it, when I lived in Wellington, which is a very small city, everyone say hi to one another. And it's, it's something that I learned that is more common in countries, it, not in Singapore. So in, when I was living in Canada and the US as well, I tend to be more friendly. There was one time that I went back to Singapore and I said hello to the, to the bus driver and he like didn't know what to do. <laughs> he was like, what is this? I don't know you. <laughs> so it, it, it's, not, it's just weird to say hi to strangers in Singapore. There's also this thing, even though Singapore um, speak English, we are separated by a common language in a way because there are things that is in British English and there are things that is in Singapore uh, Singlish and there's things in in the in uh, U.S. English. So, for example, um, I did ask once, "Hey, can you pass me the rubber?" And apparently, <laughs> I didn't know that the ru rubber in the U.S. means condoms. So, yeah, it was it was really embarrassing. When I say rubber, I mean eraser. In Singapore, we call it we call it the rubber. Yeah. So another example would be like sneakers. I, we don't use the word sneakers in Singapore or trainers. We use the word sport shoes. So something like this would be called sport shoes in Singapore. So things I miss about Singapore. Um, it's it's funny because what I what I miss most about Singapore is the nightlife. I do like. The fact that Singapore is like, it is, it is like a city that's 24 hours. There's always something open. So you don't feel bored at night. And I, I being a night owl, it's like, you know, I like to do stuff at night. So for example, Singapore has things like um, the night festival. We also have this thing called the Pasa Malam, which basically trans literally translates to the night market. So it has like street food that you can enjoy. They sell stuff there. You can just basically taking the atmosphere, it's really fun. That if you like clubbing and pubbing, stuff like that, there's always something going on in town. So you can always go and enjoy yourself at night. And there's one other thing as well, because as like, like I said, I'm, I'm a night owl, so I do like jogging at night. And I don't think I can do that here in the US because I'm a little bit afraid. While in Singapore, because it's really, really safe, my mom is not afraid of me going jogging at 2 a.m. in the morning because it's, it's super safe there. So finally, um, things that I miss most about Singapore. Well, it's basically the three Fs, I would say, is the family, the friends, and the food. Yeah, so this is my best friend, Mei Yin, and this is my other best friend, Melissa. And yeah, they, they are still living in Singapore, and I miss them so much. Uh, Food is definitely something I miss because there are just some things like ingredients that you cannot find in the, in the US. So I could not remake the same exact thing here. Um, happiness for, for only a dollar. So basically in Singapore, there, because it's so hot, there's this thing called the ice cream sandwich. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's basically bread and then a, a stick of ice cream. And that's all, that's, that's all there is. And it's a dollar. And it's really, really good. Bread and ice cream. Try it. Um, and finally, of course, this is my family. This was during my, my cousin's wedding. And yeah, I do miss my family <laughs> very much. <laughs> so, how has Singapore shaped me culturally? Um, I don't want to perpetuate the stereotype, but I am very competitive when it comes to school. I just want to make sure that I get good results in school because 
that's just the way I was raised. You have to get good results in school so that you'll get a good job and a good career and good income, etc., etc. So when it comes to um, living, in, living in countries overseas, I seem to not, not be, like, I, I'm, I'm a very good citizen. I don't, I don't do any kind of offense or fines or whatever. For example, I don't even jaywalk in the US because I was raised in Singapore to not jaywalk. That is basically crossing the road when it's not the green man or the white man, whatever you call it here. <laughs> because I'm Singaporean, and this, this is just the way I was raised. So I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. Um, another thing, um, I am very open to different races and cultures because I was raised that way. And you know, something like maybe some people were offended when she was wearing the what we call the chong sum, but. Chipao, yeah. So, so the thing is that we, I mean, for me, I, I didn't really get offended by it. I, I think she was really appreciating the culture as well. So, yeah, in my point of view, that wasn't really cultural appropriation. It's more appreciation. Uh, finally, I do like learning a lot of languages. I am currently slowly learning Japanese, and maybe after that, I might learn Mandarin. And I heard that Spanish is really important here, so I might learn that as well. So yeah, that's how Singapore has changed me culturally. Thank you very much. Any questions? You can go ahead. Okay. Use the, uh, yeah. We're talking about uh, bilingual. Mm -hmm. She said most Singapore, almost all Singaporeans are bilingual right. because in school it is compulsory to study two languages. And if you want to go to university, if you only have one language, you don't get accepted to university. You must have at least two languages. It doesn't matter what language in order to be accepted by the NUS, yes. National University of Singapore. So it is compulsory, you must have two languages. And another thing I was talking about racism. Mm -hmm. In Singapore, when you live in a public housing, the government has certain percentage. Yes, that's, that's the That's why quota. we don't want, we, because of our riots in the past, the Chinese fighting with the Malays, the Malays fighting with the Indians and all that. So the government make it a point that in this building, there must be like maybe 50% Chinese, 20% Malays, 20% Indians. So, so that they have all the different races living in the same building. Because otherwise, all the Chinese will go to one building and all the Malays go to another building. So when there's a riot, these two buildings will be fighting each other. But we have to make sure, our Singapore government, make sure yep. that your neighbor is another race. So you don't get all the Chinese in the same place. Because you congregate, you can't you stick to your own kind. So th this is one thing that right. I was going to say about racism. You have to make sure there's a balance. So in this building, you have different races in this. Let's say this building has enough Malays, and you're a Malay, you want to buy this unit, you are not eligible because we have enough Malays there. We right. need Chinese, or we need Indians, we need Eurasians, right? right. right. Yeah. So that is one yeah. way we curb racism. So I hope this kind of enlightens you guys about what's how Singaporeans live. Yeah. And I'm very proud to be a Singaporean. Even though I think so. <laughs> yeah, I can add on to that. It's like. Um, like I mentioned, the, the, H, HDB, the, the, the HDB, the public housing in Singapore, they, they have to have a quota for every single flat in Singapore, every single apartment in Singapore. So you have, for example, if there are 70% Chinese, there must be like a 15% Malay community there. So basically in Singapore, there's no such thing as enclaves at all. So ev ev everyone is mixed in the whole country. Yeah. Any other questions? Um. Yeah. Everything, I, everything is dependent on the government, mm -hmm. um, like education and housing or whatever. Right. What about healthcare? Healthcare is also highly subsidized in Singapore because you, you, can, you can also use your... Okay, so for example, remember I, I mentioned CPF, which is your savings? That can also help you with healthcare as well. So again, it's very subsidized. Uh, I would like to know how many women are in the high education in engineering, in science, in... That is, that is a question that I do not know. 
<laughs> I'm sorry if I don't know, I, I would say I don't know. But but I you can definitely send the answers, uh, send your question, and I'll we'll, we'll email you after. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. I I would say so. I would say so. Uh, women women and men they both have enough. Yeah, they ha they have all the rights to pursue any kind of education in Singapore. Yeah. Um, some some punishments for. For example, drugs and um, adultery movies. Mm -hmm. um, they ha you have the same punishments as um, as Islam, which is my religion, which right. is the area. Do you think that some rules are uh, influenced by religion? You know what? Honestly, I don't think it was influenced by religion at all. I think it's probably because Singapore, in gener generally, has a very traditional value. They have like they they they. I would say that you know they they value a, tra a traditional family. So it's like, to them, something obscene is not helping the traditional family. So that's why it's, it's very strict there when it comes to pornography. Yeah, I, I don't think it's because of Islam at all. Yeah, yeah, because, because, because in, their, in their point of view, drugs uh, destroy families. So that's why it's, it's a very strict boundary, uh, strict line when it comes to drugs. So they, they just decided that everything is illegal. All, all kind of drugs, like all even alcohol and all that? Alcohol is not banned in Singapore, but they are really expensive. So if you oh. want to be an alcoholic in Singapore, you have to be rich. <laughs> and what is the drinking age in Singapore? Drinking age in Singapore is 18. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, it's a, one last question. Since you have really harsh penalties mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, what what does Singapore? How does the Singapore handle um, the gay community and the LGBTQ community and the homosexuals, the transgender, right. whatever? That's a good question. Um, there is there is this law in Singapore actually. I can't remember the name of the law, but it's basically it says that gays are illegal, like homosexual activities are illegal in in, in Singapore. That being said, however, I don't think they they enforce the law at all. There's also this, this growing community in Singapore. It's called, it, it, it happens every year. It's called the Pink Dot. And basically what Pink Dot wants is to abolish that law. So saying that you know, gay, the gay community is fine. Because there, there is quite a big number of uh, the LGBTQ community in Singapore as well. So yeah, I think it's getting more accepting with that. Any other questions? Let's give Amira a round of applause. Thank you.